For children shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But the Bible says, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk, and they shall not faint any longer. And if Paul was here, he'd be running up and down these aisles, telling us that they who wait upon the Lord will soar with wings as eagles. <laughs> and you have that concrete assurance. You all have that concrete assurance that He will renew our strength and cause us to soar like the eagles. Do not be distracted by things on this earth. Do not be distracted by things in your own heart or your own mind. Do not be distracted by compromised relationships and attitudes. Do not be compromised in your journey of faith by human or fleshly or monetary or sinful diversions. But please, my people, be united in the love of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning we just give this time to you. We rejoice in your faithfulness. We rejoice in who you are. We are delighted, Lord, to serve you, whether it be in living or in dying. We are so comforted by the truths of your word that have lasted for thousands of years and will last for thousands of years more. We are delighted, Lord, that even though we do not understand, it makes no sense, yet you are consistent, you have a plan, you have purpose, there is a design, and all of our consultations will never change the beautiful things that you have prepared for them to love you. We are blessed today, Lord, by the presence of your Holy Spirit. May you be with this family and all of those whom they have touched in whatever part of the world they found themselves. And even right here in their own home. Lord, you are beautiful. You are glorious. We thank you and praise you for this event and for what you yet have before us. In the name of Jesus.
I'm just sitting here and I'm teaching, getting ready to teach the people about Jesus, and I want you to know about Jesus too. I know mommy and daddy will teach you, and I want to try to teach you too. The times that we spend together, we will get to, to talk about him and we'll get to know him. I just miss you so much. I really wish that we could be there for your birthday. I hope it's a really happy day. And just so I want you to remember that I love you very much. Grandma loves you very much. And Jesus loves you very much. Happy birthday. Good morning, Penny. This is where I spend my, my early parts of the morning. I get up early and usually have water. And then I sit down with my Bible and I read God's Word and I enjoy it. I like coffee just like my soup does. But better, and I know that you're a really smart boy and, and it won't be too long until you're going to start learning to read and I want you to, to learn to read God's Word too. I know Mommy reads your Bible stories, your Daddy reads your Bible stories, but I just think that it's very important that you get up the first thing in the morning and you read some Bible some of your Bible stories and you say your prayer because God will get you through every day. And I want you to walk with those women you grow. I love you. Encouraging me to move on and how proud he is of me as his mom. 
world. Um, that presence, he had in my life that encouragement from clear back to being 13 and driving a car as a produce mom. <laughs> But you know, when you've got someone, when you've got that kind of presence in your life, it, it really does. It empowers you to, um, to set the bar a little bit higher. It sometimes becomes something maybe you weren't sure you could, you could do. Well, I love kids. I you know from, uh, from Paul and, and Nick and all the times together to the, uh, the youth groups. Yesterday, I don't know how many, how many kids came up to me and, and shared their experiences with Pat through the, the youth group experience and, and all our family events. Well, um, one thing I'm not sure everybody here is aware of is how ornery Pat could be. Um, and, I, and I'll share a couple of memories with you, especially when he was with um, my daughter's uncle Mike. So Mike will give you the big brother perspective of me. But, but let me share a couple of thoughts with you. So the whole family's at mom's house for, for a, an early Christmas and um, we decided, hey, let's get some fresh air. So the whole crew's gonna walk to this hamburger, Don's Eats, a hamburger joint downtown Bell Valley. So on the way, we walk through uh, Brown Park. And at Brown Park, there's a, there's a statue. And I'm not sure who it, who it honors. But as we walk by, <laughs> um, Pat, my daughter's Uncle Pat and Uncle Mike, they convince them that that's a statue of Mike. <laughs> and it's honoring Mike when he won the spelling bee <laughs> in, in the local high school. And that took, you know, as the, as the girls learned to read, you know, everybody kind of completed, except for Danny. She was so little. So we realized it's like five years later before she actually realized that's not Uncle Mike. <laughs> so, but that was the kind of things they did. Another one that came to mind was that again, it was Uncle Pat and Uncle Mike were swimming. There's a, a municipal pool across from where uh, mom lives. And everybody's over there. And Pat and Mike had convinced the girls that when, when Uncle Pat was underwater, he can put a bubble over his head. And he can breathe, he can stay down there for days. <laughs> and so anytime Pat went in the water and would go under, the girls would scamper and get their goggles and dive in because they wanted to, they would want to see the bubble <laughs> come up over Uncle Pat's head. And um, he would tell them, of course, it's invisible. It's just, um, just the, uh, the playfulness, how um, I thought he had a way of making simple things like that a, a special experience. Family was extremely important to Pat. God came first, his family came second, then there was others, and finally himself, if that ever came. I mean, his priorities were clear, and always a terrific example for me. Um, one of our family traditions every year was to gather in Tennessee. Um, in fact, uh, mom and dad had bought a timeshare there, same week every year, and the whole intent was over the years as we all, our families grow, to get us all together for that one week. On Pat and Cheryl's um, honeymoon, they actually came back through there on the web just to, before uh, mom and dad purchased it, just to make sure it would be the vision they had for. Well, that became just a huge tradition, so every year, no matter, everyone was welcome, whoever could make it, came down there, would all converge on, um, on Tennessee, and just the, um, the memories from all of us being together down there, but the one, I had, had a few ask me yesterday, there was a um, picture in the, in the video, and it showed Pat with a thumb down, and behind him was a sign that said, no bumping of cars, no car bumping, and everybody said, what was that? Well, that sign was put up by them, I think, because of our family. <laughs> because that week, one of the big events was we would all go to this go-kart race track, and it became nothing but bumping of cars. Just real aggressive. We all became kids, competitive people. Um, Danny was started this height, and you had to be a certain height. Remember that before you could actually drive a car. So as soon as we would pull in to go back to the resort, we'd have to stop there. Danny would scamper out to see if she was tall enough this year to drive her own car and compete against Uncle Pat and, and everybody. So there's just, um, uh, remember um, John? Always claiming victory when he lost. And, um, and just some terrific memories. But again, just um, um, just some times when, when you look back at uh, Pat's hand and all that. I could go on with memories of, of Tennessee forever, but I'll never forget the, uh, the go karts I saw is neat that, that you guys had included that in the, in the video yesterday, and how many questions that um, 
it, it arose. But just again, a simple thing turned into a, a very special experience. And finally, you know, Peck showed me really how to live a significant life. Um, he helped others help themselves. I think Haiti was a terrific example of my brother Peck. Um, he shared with me once that you know, they'd gone over a number of times before um, Cheryl and Peck moved there. He told, you know, they told him that you, know, you bring Bibles, you bring your Christian doctrine, and then you leave. And you never stay here. You need somebody to show us how to live as a Christian, how to build that faith. And I was talking to Pat Rudolph once, as Brian mentioned, and he shared that with me as part of the motivation to move there and really demonstrate, live out the faith, and show how, how Christians do live. And then you talk about the family gardens, the schools, the microloans, all a self-sustaining vision. And I think Brian asked a good question, well, why? Pat just all this momentum, everything. You know the, the seed is planted. Now God will find someone else to harvest. We'll never know all the lives have been touched, the full impact he's made. But you know one example, Pat didn't just get involved. He got engaged. Everything. He got engaged. He was passionate. He assumed a leadership role and he made a difference. A lasting difference. A lasting contribution. That's the path I love and root for. Um, what we'd like to do is, um, my brother Mike is going to share the big brother's perspective, but we're curious if maybe um, anyone here had a Pat story, a memory that, that you'd like to share. And if so, we've got some, some mics here. Um, let us know. We'll give you an opportunity to, um, to share a, a memory of Pat. Scared to death, and Pat, he was just cool. He, 
He didn't have any cares in the world about anything. And I remember we stopped in one bar and um, asked the guy if he could pray for him. And he said no. But that's just that's just who Pat was. And, and uh, I, I just I was so appreciative of the model that he gave for me in my life. And, and, uh, and just serving him. Steve, cousin of the Maurer side, one of the older cousins, and uh, I think it's uh, the last time I saw that, or was I believe uh, just before they went, at a family reunion, and I remember, and I think I can speak for all of us who knew that, that we were all both moved and proud. Grandma's, 
Mom came in and much to her horror, we were backing our tractors into the nativity set and taking the cows and putting them over on the other side, we're getting ready to milk. <laughs> Pat told me, he said, I don't know what she's so mad about, we didn't break anything yet. <laughs> but I will say that down through time, all the things that Pat had passion for, not everything was good when he was younger, just like many of us. But it was through my sister-in-law, Cheryl, coming into his life, transforming all those rough edges into something that was worthy of everything that he became. And Cheryl, without you as that partner, uh, would never have come to pass. Thanks for your involvement in our life, but also perhaps to say a couple of things. First of all, when my brother Dave gets up here and starts talking about family stuff, I never really know how things are going to go. Okay, hang on just a second. You did good there, but uh, by leaving out some of the other things, I really we're kind of glad that you didn't leave out. This. <laughs> Sometimes we get involved in things that go on that are called a vocabulary building moments. And for any dad, how many dads we got in here? Every once in a while you get involved with sons who show up maybe when they feel like it or maybe are a little bit difficult to find them right when the real work starts. Well, Pat had one of these moments of, I think rather than allowing everyone else around to observe someone that maybe was having a bad moment. The vocabulary building was done shouting inside that barrel so that no one else could hear what was going on. I'm not sure how many of them understood English, but I'm sure they understood those words. So, without being too graphic, um, I hope you really understand. Mom says that was his attitude, Justin. <laughs> A couple of things. First of all, I was talking to, this was when she was about 13, my niece Tara. It was around Easter time, we were having a conversation, actually it was a debate, I think, about what was the most important verse in the Bible. And she immediately said, it was John 3.16. And then we started talking about why was John 3.16. And she finally said, well, it's because it's God's simple plan of salvation. Anybody knows that on the way. Then we started talking about what we do with John 3.16. She said, you know, all of the religions in the world are put together so that we can show, one man can show another man that he believes in John 3.16. Remember that conversation? There's a passage that reminds me of my brother Pat. It's written in uh, James, James 2, 14 to 17. It says, what is good, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister was out, is without clothes of daily food. If one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. If you could take two words and put them into my brother Pat, it would be all in. Anything that he was ever part of, he was with all the way. Um, my son's grandfather was a farmer. He worked bailing hay was getting ready to, to start raining and uh, there were there was enough hay on the ground of for probably three or four more bales and we had a wagon load. So Pat was home from the service. I thought, okay, I'm gonna climb up on top of the wagon. Why don't you just toss those last couple of bales up too? Okay, so he grabbed the first one and reached down and gave it a little toss and it went up over the wagon, over me standing up and <laughs> That's Pat. There's a picture in the, that was uh, in the roll where everyone else is carrying the concrete blocks up on their head. Pat had two. Everyone else had one. That's how Pat 
went about his life with, with things, doing more or at least as much as anyone else could. Fishing. Anybody that's been around him understands that that's passion for fishing. When he was a young man, as he was driving around, he would keep his Zebco pocket fisherman in the trunk. So just in case he'd be driving past a pond that looked like it might have fish in it, he'd see if he can't fish it. And if it was a bunker, then he would pull out hot dog they were having dinner tonight. He'd bring home the lawn, they'd skin it and fish it, you know, scale it, and, and that was dinner for the night. But he had a, a great passion for fishing. Um, golfing. We talked about golfing for a little bit. Here's my idea of golfing. A perfect round of golf is Losing fewer balls than holes that you play. That's rule number one. Rule number two is making sure that you understand that you play par golf because you filled up the, the scorecard before you left. And rule number three, and I think Pat agreed with me on this one, was having one year left to get from the cart to the car when everything is said and done. Now, Pat's idea of golf was score. I would do when I shot things like that. So oftentimes, when we were down in Tennessee, the uh, golf games would kind of morph into bumper cars and race it from one hole to the next. We would take the tees and put them in the governors to open the governors up on the golf carts. And we had some pretty uh, pretty good races and things. And they, yes, we did bump in a couple. I think we even heard one over. So don't tell anybody that in there. But the, the, the sign that they had about no bumping and things, you could have put that on the golf cart. Pat was a man of action. Pat showed did things in Russia, China. There's a particular story that he told me, and I'm not sure how much of this I understand specifically, but in the Middle East, Pat was talking to a guy at the Wailing Wall one day. And he related this to me later. He said, you know, this guy, he was obviously Jewish, but he knew more about my Bible than I think I knew. Went back the next day, and as it turns out, in the conversation, was a former Methodist minister, so I think he would have known a little bit more about it and converted to Judaism and Pat, and he had a great debate on who knew more about the Bible or, as he was mentioned to say around me, my life. Pat always had a big view of things. If you were thirsty, there's some pictures of him digging the well. It wasn't just, I'll give you a drink, I'll show you how you can have water for good. And if you were hungry, asked him what that stuff was, he would give you some vegetable or fruit and say, here, try this. And let me show you, you can do this as well. Pat lived his life by two models. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's the first one. The second one is more Christian to Christian. Grace is the thread that God weaves into the hearts of his believers. And I think Pat lived in both of them. When you go back to those two passages, the John 3.16, okay, guilty as charged, there are some things that I say that we need to do and uh, different things that maybe others need to do when we are inside the church itself. But the thing that Pat always lived was Make sure people can understand what you believe by how you live your life. And he lived that everywhere he went. When our dad passed away, Pat wrote a poem. And I've changed it a little. For those of you who knew my dad and know Pat, um, they're almost identical in their outlooks, in the way they went about doing things for people and with people. And uh, I didn't have to make many changes, but a couple. So bear with me here for a moment. On a bright day in heaven, not long ago, God was heard to say, I've been saving this special clay. I think I'll make a man today. A child was born. And as he grew, he wore a mischievous grin. He played lots of games, always giving his all, saying, it's how you play, not if you do it. This creed was how he lived his life, and the lives he touched were many. If he saw a need, 
He's a stranger to greed. He'd give you his very last penny. As a husband and friend, he's loyal to the end. By example, he would always be. When challenged by strife, shunning the comforts of life, he endeavored his friends to feed. Whatever the task, fix a toy, build a house, he would always give you his best. When every detail was right, sometimes far into the night, only then would the job done would he rest. To see others do well, loads of praise he would tell of his friends or his kids or his wife, ignoring his pain so that others could gain. To see others do well was his life. If life were gained, I'd want him at the back so I could tell everyone that's what sales call was a lot of time to speak. So I was thinking about some memories of that path. And the first one was every time you walked in the room, he'd give you a little pat up. He'd tell you he loved you. He asked how you're doing. And he's one of those few people that really meant it. He wanted to know how you were doing. And he wasn't satisfied until he told you. Um, I thought about sometimes in a gathering place and someone walked through the door and you need something. And Pat was always the first person there to, to see what they needed and he'd follow through with it. And then that person would come through five, six, seven, ten more times and the rest of us are kind of starting to feel a little bit abused. But Pat's still over there loving that person. Every single time. Never quit. It didn't matter how much money they needed or how much food he had to buy for them or how many places he had to drive them. He'd do it every time. And so I'm starting to think of all these attributes of Pat um, kind of making them unique. And the Lord prompted me to write them down and fill the whole page. And I probably could have kept going, but then the Lord just kind of spoke to me. You see, there's no one here like Pat. They can call you guys are probably more like Pat than anybody here. But there'll never be another person like him. And I kind of made me sad that I started to think what made Pat like Pat. You see, Pat couldn't have had those attributes without the spirit of the living God inside of him. And so kind of, my heart jumped for joy because now, the spirit of Pat was the spirit of Christ. And that spirit lives inside of us. And so we can be like Pat who is like Christ. And so that's just my, my blessing to you, Nick and Cole and Cheryl, just to, to continue being like Pat because you can have those same attributes. We all can have those same attributes that Pat had. So we're going to sing a couple more songs. And uh, they're songs that family and we chose because it reminds us of Pat. It so as we sing these next two, I just want to share a little bit too. I have this image burning in my head of dozens of times. And there's Pat and Cheryl, and they're normally two to three rows deep, right in the middle. And... Uh, Pat's standing up. He normally has both hands up. And um, it didn't matter how loud everyone was singing or how loud it was in general, you could always hear Pat. And so to honor him, these next couple, two more songs are more about hope and, and life. Why don't we just all stand up? And uh, if you want to join in singing, you can. But let's, uh, let's just, I guess, celebrate Pat's life joy and uh, by standing together and singing.
Lord, I just thank you this morning for my brother, friend, husband, dad. And at least for me, I know lots of other people in this room, mentor and dad. Lord, we let them go. It doesn't always feel willing. Trust you. Lord, his legacy will go on and on, and yet he'll get all the glory. Because that's who he was. And so I thank you for today. Thank you so much for this opportunity to get together and cry, laugh, cheer for a man that impacted us all. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated.